Okay, so, well, I'm glad Remy gave the first talk, actually, because he did all the hard lifting, all the neural networks, connections, architecture, all the jargon in the field. I'm going to be very pedestrian because Jared is in the audience, and I, I know that I have to be at a very low level for him to, <laughs> to capture this, right? So, so uh, well, this is the usual hype, right? Neural networks, deep neural networks are doing things we didn't imagine possible. This is not my words, it's somebody else's. And uh, we still don't understand on a foundational level why. I think we don't understand, and uh, that'll be the purpose of my talk. What's going on that gives it this increased performance? But as I said, I'm going to be very pedestrian because I'm just going to speak about uh, ReLU activation. Remy already introduced what ReLU is, so I'm not doing ReLU squared. I'm just doing ReLU. And I'm also going to talk just about approximation of the univariate functions. So I'm putting myself in the best possible situation to prove something, right? Low-hanging fruit, hopefully. All right, so Remy already introduced what uh, ReLU is and it gave you some feeling as to what these spaces are. Now, what's important in my talk is I have a very specific architecture. In Remy's case, he allowed the width. So at a given layer, you have a certain number of neurons. I call that the width. And then you have a certain number of layers. And I'm going to fix that at every layer I have the same width. OK? And I'm going to assume full connectivity. I'm not going to worry about sparsity. So this would be a, a, the architecture of a network with width 3, right? And uh, L layers. And my interest is to understand what's the benefit of L. Going deeper into the network, what does this buy you versus keeping L small? and letting the width get large. Okay. So we already understood from Remy's talk, if you caught it, that if you look at just one hidden layer of the neural network, and I'm in the univariate case, it produces any piecewise linear function with W breakpoints. Right? Any function that's piecewise linear and breaks its linearity at w point. There's a little, OK, essentially this is true. You get every such function, and that's exactly what you're getting. Do you all agree with that? So this is nothing different than what we used to call free knot spline approximation or free knot piecewise linear. And of course, we felt we knew everything you wanted to know about that. So, you know, if you keep one hidden layer and you use ReLU activation, we feel we know what's going on. But what I want to do is I want to fix W. And you should think of W, the width, as being small. Three, four, five, two. You can't get smaller than two. Three, four, five, six in that range, and let the number of layers grow and see what happens. OK? That's sort of where I'm going. All right. So as Remy uh, emphasized often, that if you look at any node and what function you have at the node, I think of a, a node as corresponding to a, a function, if you go back here, and in my case, you're inputting a real number, you compute, you have a function of x at each node, right? This function of x looks like x minus some psi 1 plus a ReLU of some shift of x. And 
as you progress in the network, at every node you have a function, right? And this function is gotten from the previous layer by linear combinations of bias and applying a ReLU. So, and this idea of expressivity, which is a new word to me, I don't know how other people in the approximation community feel, but I don't like the word expressivity. Okay, it bothers me. But, uh, okay, at every node, you're going to get a piecewise linear function, right? And now I'm looking this upsilon, this symbol, by the way, is upsilon, and it's uh, a little bit annoying in tech, but Ingrid wanted this symbol, so, you know, you have to uh, accommodate that. So this space here is the space where the W is fixed, L is fixed. I look at all outputs, all functions that could be outputted by this network, and that's the space upsilon WL. Everybody clear on that? So I don't want to lose anybody at this, this point. So this is a nonlinear space. What does it mean that it's nonlinear? If I took two of the outputs and added them together, it wouldn't be in the space, generally. Just like with piecewise linear functions, if you take a piecewise linear function with four breakpoints, add another one with four breakpoints, you're going to have eight breakpoints. It's not going to be in the space with four breakpoints. Similarly here, this is a nonlinear space. Okay, in the case that L is 1, we've already talked about it, you get the space of piecewise linear functions, which is usually denoted by sigma w in the literature of approximation. And uh, I'm, I'm interested in saying how does this new space relate to sigma w or sigma n? So what new piecewise linear functions am I getting in when I add this depth L that I didn't have if I kept the depth to be 1, all right? So I'm going to uh, let n denote the number of parameters used in, in the network. So n in our case is roughly w squared times L, right? Because to make one connection, you have a matrix with W squared entries, you have a bias with W, and anyway, this is the number of uh, parameters that are available to you. Do you agree? Yeah, okay. So I, I, I rather think about these spaces as indexed on the number of parameters rather than the W or L. So think of W as fixed, I'm allowing L to vary, L determines the n, roughly the n is like w squared L. And I'm interested in what's happening as n gets larger, okay? Okay, the first uh, theorem, which, you know, I originally thought this would be almost a triviality, that uh, if I fix w, think of w as 4 or 6, for the rest of this talk, that as I increase L, I actually contain sigma n with a value of L like n. Okay, read what this says. This says sigma n, remember that's the space of all piecewise linear functions with n pieces, and I can capture any function in sigma n by taking a network with width 4, and just letting L progress on. And the, the, the size of L I'll need is roughly N. Right? Okay. That seems like uh, it would be easy to prove. It's not so easy to prove. And I just mentioned uh, what the architecture looks like for this proof because I said I'm considering networks with fixed width w and complete 
uh, connections as I move forward in the network, but in actuality, the network we use is a subset of this network with two dedicated channels. The first dedicated channel just pushes X forward, never does anything in this channel except reproduce X. By the way, this could all be put in the jargon of your skip networks. And the bottom channel, we call it a collation channel. And it, the only thing it does is it gathers what computation you've done up to that point. So for example, if your network, if you stopped at this layer and outputted, if it outputted uh, a piecewise linear S, then I can deposit that S in the collation channel. And I can go on with the network in a completely independent from S way, produce another T, right, later in the network, and then add it to the S in the collation channel. You catching? You get the idea? Yeah. OK, so that's the architecture used in, in the proof of this result. And this result is proven by showing that certain, if you, you fixed it with W, I said let's take W equal 4, that you can produce certain piecewise linear functions with one layer or two layers of a, a neural network with, with 4. And the, the ones that you can produce, you can essentially write as a basis by shifting them around for the complete set sigma n. So if you continue on with your layers in the network, you'll get all of sigma n. OK, is this interesting? I don't know. Uh, let's talk about the relevance of this from the point of view of approximation. Remy introduced the idea of approximating, that uh, you have your target function f. You have some norm. He used LP norms. It doesn't matter what the norm is theoretically. And you can say, OK, this is the best I could approximate f if I use piecewise linear functions with n pieces. OK, the error will be denoted by sigma n. On the other hand, if I use deep neural networks with n parameters, I would have an error, which is upsilon n. That turns out to be a lowercase upsilon doesn't look much different from a V. And what we've just shown is that this is at least as good as this. Well, that's not uh, anything to write home about and be excited about. But it shows that you at least don't lose anything if, in terms of the number parameters if you use deep neural networks rather than piecewise linear. OK. But we want to see that you gain something. It'd be good to know if you gain something. Uh, OK. So you don't lose anything. Do you gain something? All right. Remy introduced the idea of approximation classes. So in his jargon, or Actually, it's a common jargon in approximation theory. You can look at a given approximation process, like the sigma n, which was just piecewise linear with n pieces, or upsilon n, which are the outputs of a neural network with n parameters. And you can say what functions are approximated with a given rate in whatever norm you want. And we call that an approximation class, AR. Same notation as U. OK. And this is a, a quasi-normed uh, space. But our interest is, is the class AR for the neural networks much bigger than the class AR for piecewise linear. And that's why I asked you this question about the part I missed 
while I was gone. Remy said somehow, yes, we know that this class is bigger than that class, and I was trying to understand in what sense does he, he know this. Okay. So it's actually uh, easy to show that the approximation class, notice when we talk about the approximation class, you're looking at uh, letting n change, right? You have a family of nonlinear spaces, let's say upsilon n, and you're saying as you invest more and more parameters, what's the rate of approximation? If it's n to the minus r, that means the function is an ar. Okay? So part of what Remy was talking about was the fact that if you have piecewise, uh, if you just have the piecewise linear case, not the neural network case, we actually know what AR sigma n is. This is a big advantage. That we can actually characterize exactly which functions are in this space. So we feel we know precisely uh, how piecewise linear approximation is behaving. What we're searching for is to understand how deep neural networks, their approximation behaves. Okay, so it, it's true that this space here for uh, neural networks, deep neural networks, is going to be a bigger space than this. What does that mean? There's going to be functions which can be approximated well by this family of spaces by using neural networks depending on n parameters that you couldn't get if you just used piecewise linear with n pieces. Everybody clear what we're sort of driving at here? Okay. Now what, what's the reason or what's the uh, machinery behind getting uh, these new functions which couldn't be gotten by piecewise linear but getting them by deep networks. Uh, the key property, well, let me first mention that in both cases, that if you take two functions, one S and T, one from upsilon n, upsilon m, you add them together, you get something in upsilon n plus m. This is obvious, is it, to everybody? From our ar architecture, we just throw S in the collation channel, go on compute T, throw it in a collation channel, and add them together. So I mentioned that these are not linear spaces. If you take S from upsilon n and T from upsilon n, add them together, you don't get something in upsilon n, but you get it in upsilon 2n. Okay? But sigma n has the same property. Well, that's not the secret. The, the secret is the composition, and everybody who works in this field is well aware of this fact, that if you take, if you can produce a function S with n parameters in your neural, neural network, and, and you can produce a function T with m parameters in the neural network, then you can produce the composition s of t of x with n plus m parameters. The fact that it's n plus m is critical. For example, if you take polynomials, if you take a polynomial of degree n and another polynomial, say p, and a polynomial q of degree m, their composition requires n times m parameters, right? So the fact that you have n plus m is very critical of saving you on the number of parameters in compositions. This is very much similar to tensor structures, if you're familiar with that, in people doing tensor analysis. Okay, so this to me is a critical thing that you can do with uh, deep networks that you can't do with many other traditional forms of approximation. Okay, so everybody knows this, and I think this is the secret. For example, here's the hat function that Remy says, oh, you can produce this with three nodes. Well, you can produce it with a, with a very, uh, I'm fixing W, remember? I can 
take L equal 1, W equal 4, I can get this function. And then if I start changing L, I can produce these sawtooth functions, right? If L is N, if I take N layers, I can get this piecewise linear function with 2 to the N pieces. Notice the number of pieces is 2 to the N. The number of parameters is just N, right, or constant times N. That's, that's critical. Oh, everybody knew this. So this is the, the power of composition. With very few parameters, you produce very complicated functions, or rather complicated. OK, there's a general uh, theorem that I want to mention without being too awfully precise. That it doesn't have to be the hat function. You can begin with any fixed function in upsilon k. So think of k as fixed, 5. And you've produced some piecewise linear function. And then you can pick any intervals you want, j1, j2, jm, and ask to take this function and replicate it on each interval, except that it's dilated, it's squeezed, so that it support fits here. That's like the hat function. In the hat function case, all the intervals were the same width when I produced the sawtooth function. But this kind of a function, for example, you can always produce, and the number of parameters you need is just the number of intervals m and the original k for this. So you can produce self-similar patterns. And of course, you can add self-similar patterns, so you can produce, yeah, you can start thinking in terms of building blocks that there's some fractal-like structure that's going on here. And indeed, you can look at the, what I'm striving for are functions that you can't produce with piecewise linear sigma n, but you can produce with upsilon n. And here's examples. You can take any pattern and reproduce it on any partition into intervals. Well, that's, those are functions you couldn't get. If you asked to get this with piecewise linear, you would need way too many pieces, because I only need k plus m parameters, whereas the number of breakpoints is k times m, right? OK, so there's a, this is part of the power. Using these, this idea, you can build a lot of functions that are captured by neural networks, deep neural networks that aren't captured by sigma n. Just to give you the general principle, suppose you can create some functions fk in upsilon k. So we now know, for example, you can create in uh, uh, upsilon n, you can create a hat function with 2 to the n breakpoints, very highly oscillatory function, right? And let me normalize it so that it has norm 1 and whatever Banach space norm I'm interested in. <laughs> then if you take a linear combination of these functions, and I just require that these coefficients are summable, then the function I get well, you can estimate the, uh, how well you can approximate it with n squared. I, it's n squared because to add n functions, you need a network of size n squared, generally. If you have n functions with each in upsilon n, you would need a network of size n squared. Anyway, you get an estimate that this function, f, that you create has a certain error of approximation governed by these coefficients. So if these coefficients go to 0 fast enough, this function is well approximated, even though this function has many, many, many breakpoints. I mean, you just think, you know, it's, it's going up and down, up and down zillions of times. 
let's uh, give you some examples. Okay, so I want to give you now, now you start to think, so I'm now going to be advertising neural networks and saying, wow, well, aren't they great? Look at all the things they can do. For one thing, they can approximate, if you take any analytic function, they can approximate this with exponential order. Why is that? Well, you show that x squared can be approximated with, with exponential order, and then you start doing compositions, x, x squared, right? You get all the x to the k with exponential order, and then any linear combination. So this is nice. This, this means that they're, they're spectral-like methods, right? You know, in numerical analysis, we talk about spectral methods. That means they're not, uh, they're not saturated by the number of derivatives that the function has. Like finite element methods, they will, they will stop at a certain number of derivatives. Here, you just keep differentiating, and you get higher and higher approximation. Uh, there, there are in, in uh, dynamical systems, there are these functions called Tagaki functions. How are they gotten? You take a, a fixed function psi, and you compose it many, many times. It gives you psi k. You apply an outer function g to it, and then you sum them with some parameter t. t is a real number and think of it as less than 1. The simplest example of a Tagaki function is this one. These are the hat functions, right? h composed with itself k times. That's the sawtooth guy going up and down 2 to the k times. If I add them all together, look at that function, f. This is called the Weierstrass function. No? So some Russian, some Russian name. Every, everything was invented first I by Russians. Well, I know it as the Weierstrass function. The important thing is that this function is the simplest example of a function that's in Lipschitz 1, but nowhere differentiable. Look, look, look at this one. It goes up and down, and you're adding them together, tearing them together. So this is a function that's nowhere differentiable, but approximated by neural networks with exponential accuracy. So we have two ends of the spectrum. If the function is real nice, we can get it with exponential accuracy. But also, at this end, it doesn't have any nice differentiability, and we get it. Of course, here it has some self-similarity, right? It's going up and down in a patterned way. That relates back to, to this result that I mentioned about piecing together things. OK, so in this way, you can create zillions of functions that can be approximated well by deep networks that you can't approximate well by piecewise uh, linear with n pieces. So that, that's for sure the case. Now, should you go away happy and say, yes, well, wonderful, this thing is powerful. Now I'm going to become a little bit more negative. Oh, by the way, OK, before I become a little negative, uh, you can create within upsilon n uh, bases, a basis of functions. There are two to the n of these. They look like sines and cosines. They're in upsilon n n parameters. There are two to the n functions. So you get the sines and cosines up to degree two to the n. But they're all in upsilon n with n parameters. You get the dichotomy. I'm not creating this. This is a, a linear. This is the basis for a linear space of dimension two to the n. But they live in this nonlinear space, if you want to call it, of dimension n, n parameters. OK. And you can create many such bases like this. OK, this is the re spaces. OK, now I want to get a little more negative, or actually to, to 
dig into this a little deeper. So I'm going to give you some results that look too good to be true, too good for me. Uh, and then I question, why the heck are they true? They don't seem like they should, should be, be the case. Uh, the first one I want to mention is the result of Urotsky. Relates to your Bessoff. No, that lip one in the Bessoff space. Urotsky proved that if f is in lip one, you can approximate it with accuracy, not one over n, which you would everybody would say, oh, that's what you get. You do. If you approximate a function in lip one by piecewise linear, you know, you just interpolate on an equally spaced grid, and you'll get accuracy one over n. And I'm measuring error now in the norm of C, uniform error. Everybody understand that a lip one function, if you take n pieces equally spaced, you approximate it with accuracy one over n. If I told you I can do this using n parameters that get better than one over n, you would at first scratch your head and say, well, I don't think so. How are, how are you going to do that? But the neural nets do that. And you can prove it using that self-similarity result. And I think because of time, I, I won't give you the proof. But this should disturb you a little bit, the log n. Does it bother you at all? Bore, the log n. Not really. You sleep good at night, no matter what. No, I have something, but it takes time to explain. OK. Well, the second one was already mentioned by Remy. Doesn't this bother you, this Majorov pinkest result, that you can pick, uh, cleverly pick and activate? I mean, you went over this very fast. It didn't say that it bothered you, but it bothers me. You can pick one activation function. OK, this is not going to be ReLU anymore. It's going to be one activation function rho, complicated. But you're going to create a very finite neural network, right? The width, I don't know if this matches your numbers, the width 9 and depth 3. So you only have so many neurons, right? 27 neurons and only so many parameters. And you get everything, every function. This, if you look at the outputs of this network, it's dense in C of 0, 1. Dense. Well, actually, you can do this in RD. This is for D equal 1. So what is this? This is a space-filling manifold, right? You, you all learned when you studied calculus, be careful. You can have on a unit square, right? You can have a curve that fills all of the unit square and, and parameterized, right? What goes wrong with that curve? Well, if you start looking at the parameters and you want to move from here very close by to a near point, the parameter changes tremendously, right? Boom. I mean, you need to, you know, unbounded parameters to keep moving around. So you learn that. And that should scare you about these neural networks. Am I, am I producing things, and the reason I'm getting them all, all these great things is because I'm letting the parameters go wild. Right? Shouldn't that scare you a little bit? It scares me. OK. All right, so we now uh, turn, I think, to the, the, the critical part. And Bore asked me this 30 minutes ago. He said, well, do these, are these proofs constructive? Do they tell you how, given f, do you find this good approximation? What, we're, we, what Remy and I have been talking about is given f, there exists some function that does the approximation. And you now have to say, well, can you produce this function? How do you do it? And this becomes. Critical. I think there is a paper by somebody that shows that you can't do best approximation with neural networks that's continuous. So generally speaking, in approximation theory, one of the first questions we ask is, OK, you have the best approximation. Can you get close to best approximation with nice mappings? 
like projections or, and no, in this case you cannot. Okay, how do we view approximation in the constant of uh, neural networks? Well, we have this space upsilon n, which I think of as a parametric manifold, right? I look at the outputs. To know the output, I just need to know the parameters. So give me the parameters, I get an output. So that mapping maps parameters into continuous functions on 0, 1. This is some manifold in C of 0, 1, right? So I view this as a parametric manifold. Sigma n is also that way. And there are many other parametric manifolds, right? OK, so if I know the parameters, then we know how to create the output, right? We stick them into the network, create the, what it appears at every neuron, and get the output. So that mapping we know, M. But we're asking about the mapping. Given F, how do you find the parameters? OK, if you want to build an approximation scheme, what do you have to do? You start with F. And you have to say, oh, I'm going to find the, the network for f. I'm going to find the parameters for f. Well, think of that as a mapping, that you take f and you map it into a point in Rn, since we have n parameters. And this is the critical mapping that I want to understand. You with me? Neural network? OK. And you say, oh, I do this by. Uh, Gradient descent and on this, that, shuffle your feet, whatever. OK, I don't care what you did, but you created this A. That given F, you told me how to create the parameters associated to it, find the network associated to it. So this is a special case of what we call manifold approximation. You have two mappings. You t given your function F, the first mapping finds the point in Rn, finds the parameters. The second mapping, given the parameters, tells you how to reconstruct your function. How am I doing time-wise? Um, several minutes. OK. That's all I'll need, I think. OK. So let's look at neural network approximation in a broader context. Let's look at, you know, you say, well, I'm going to use neural network. OK. But allow me to use any mappings A and M. Why not? What's so special? I mean, you don't hold the rights to all such uh, procedures. Maybe I come up with some other scheme that takes my function, maps it into Rn, and then takes Rn and maps it into back into C. So I look at all pairs of mappings AM. A extracts the parameters, M reconstructs. And I can say, all right, let's look at them, and let's see the best we can do over all mappings A and M. That's what the first thing we crazy people that work in approximation do. We say, oh, you have your particular way of doing it, but let me see if I can beat it. Let's look at all possible mappings A and M. See if maybe we can beat it, OK? And we can look at the performance on F, but it's better to look at the performance on classes, compact sets like Remy's Bethoff classes. OK. Now, if you propose to do this, the first thing somebody's going to ask you, wait a minute, wait a minute, what are you going to assume about A? And what are you going to assume about M? OK. And you say, oh, I, I don't assume anything. OK. If you don't assume anything, I can get a space filling manifold. And I'll get that for every compact set K, this is no conditions, right? For every compact set K, this will be 0. OK? So if you don't put any conditions on A and M, you are allowing space filling manifolds, and you'll be able to approximate everything beautifully. You can walk home, tell your wife, look what I did. I approximate everything with only n parameters. n is 1. One parameter, I get everything. Wow, you know? She'll say, I don't understand, honey, but good. Let's have dinner now. <laughs> OK. 
Let's go back here. Well, the next thing you could do is say, oh, well, OK, I realize you've got a problem with space filling, so I'll assume a little bit. Would you accept if I only assume A and M are continuous? OK, so you say, OK, I'll assume A and M are continuous. We introduced this a long time ago, Charlie Michelli and Ralph Howard and I. This is called the manifold width, where we only assumed continuity of A and M. Okay, so that's delta N. And when I put a star here, I'm going to go further. I'm going to assume not only that A and M are continuous, but that are Lipschitz mappings. You can put whatever topology you want on RN. I want them to be Lipschitz. Now you say, well, why do you want now all of a sudden Lipschitz? Well, I claim that this corresponds with numerical stability. And this has become an issue. OK, so we have three definitions of width. We, we discard this one because space filling. This one, I mentioned to you that if you look back at lip 1, you can prove that the width is n to the minus 1. Namely, if you go back to Yurotsky, remember that guy? In the lip 1, 1 over n log n. Can't be true if a and m are continuous. He cannot produce continuous mappings to do that. So he's saying there exists a guy, but when you create the guy that for, for this f and you perturb f a little bit, the new guy is way far away from the you know, you ha don't have stability any longer. And now finally, if, <clears throat> if you impose Lipschitz, then I, then I want to claim there is a limit to how well you can do. OK, so we impose Lipschitz. And what, let, now I need to assume that x is Hilbert space, so like L2. That just says the way I measure error. Then I claim that uh, two things happen. First, that if you can produce with your manifold mappings and all that accuracy n to the minus r, then the entropy numbers, I'll get to them in a minute, behave like n to the minus r. But also conversely. So I'm going to tell you what the entropy numbers are. But the important thing is that the performance you're going to receive on k is exactly the same as the entropy numbers of k. OK, so what are the entropy numbers? This goes back to Kolmogorov entropy. It says if you take a compact set in some Bonnock space, and you want the entropy of it, it says take an, fix an epsilon for the radius of balls and ask how many balls will you need to cover this set of radius epsilon. This is called the covering number. But to get this epsilon n, we say the following. We say we give you a budget of only 2 to the n such balls. So that given n, you only can use 2 to the n. It corresponds to bits, right? 2 to the n is n bits. You, you're required to have 2 to the n balls. And now we say, what's the smallest epsilon that we can cover this with 2 to the n balls? That's epsilon n. So a set k has this entropy. And we always thought in approximation, no numerical scheme, no approximation is going to do better than epsilon n. It defied us to think you could do better. And Yurovsky says, no, no, you get 1 over n log n. And I said, wow, should be 1 over n. Why do you get the log n? You get the log n because these mappings are very unstable. OK. So what did I tell you? I told you that, all right, there are a lot of functions. The way I view upsilon n, the deep networks, I view it as a nonlinear manifold. And I'm worried about its space filling. You may say, oh, it's great if it gets all these functions. Isn't it wonderful? But I say, no, I mean, look, if you only have n, think of n as 2. You only have two parameters, and you're getting everything. You're doing it in a very unstable way. This bothers me. You know, something's wrong here. Don't be so happy just because you get in upsilon n all these functions you didn't get before. Are you getting them in a stable way? Or are you just filling out a manifold? OK, and I, I mentioned some questions. This is the last slide. 
are there classes where, so you think these <laughs> deep uh, neural networks are great, we exhibit some classes where they perform better than other methods, but are there classes where they don't perform so great? I mean, are there classes where their performance is worse than epsilon nk? Can't do better if it's stable, but will it be worse? I think so. Why not? I mean, it's sort of predicated on the self-similarity and all that. I should be able to create functions that aren't self-similar that I have a hard time dealing with. Okay, I've mentioned several times that stability is an issue here. Uh, I don't see how we go forward without, uh, by just talking about expressivity, I don't see how we go forward without just, with just talking about the error in approximation. We have to enter stability into this picture, otherwise we're, we're not careful enough. Okay, and then finally, two remarks about learning, because I, I, I always see confusion when I see the talks on learning. In learning, what's the difference? Is learning high dimensional? I mean, we're talking about functions of two variables. Even images are functions of two variables, right? I mean, they're projections of a 3D function onto a 2D plane, pixel. The difference is the information we have about the function. We're not given complete information about f. We're only given the pixel values, all right? So the way we in approximation think, we think, first, what could you do to approximate if you were given complete information? And then second, OK, if we're only given partial pixel information, our hands are tied, we don't see all of f, we only see these averages, now what can we do? And we want to understand the difference. And I think this viewpoint could be useful here. Uh, okay, that's it. All right, so thank you.